good evening, everyone. Thank you so much indeed for, for, for coming uh, this evening. It's my very great pleasure uh, to welcome all of you to the Royal United Services Institute tonight. Our, our very special guest this evening is Sir Nicholas Horton, the new Chief of the Defence Staff, and it is his words that everyone here has come to, to hear, not, not mine, and I can tell you it's a, it's a very great pleasure to me. Um, we're very fortunate to have Nick here. His, his, his biography is, has been circulated, and it really doesn't need me to add anything to it other than to say that Nick has rendered some extraordinary service to our country. Uh, and we are very, very fortunate and grateful to you, Nick, for, for coming here tonight. I think this probably couldn't be a more appropriate time to hear the CDS's views on a range of matters. Our armed forces at the moment face a, a number of significant challenges, operational, strategic, and, of course, there is a, a new spending review uh, looming uh, up at us very quickly indeed. Uh, and Nick is going to speak, uh, and his remarks will be on the record, but the question and answer session that we have uh, after that will not be attributable. So we expect the House rule uh, to be observed uh, on, uh, on that occasion. Uh, could I ask you before um, I ask CDS to, to speak to us to make sure all of your mobile uh, phones and tablets are switched off? Um, there isn't going to be um, any uh, emergency uh, rehearsal tonight. If the alarm bells go, it, it is for real. Uh, so, so please follow the Rusi staff, who you will see uh, at the back of the room, uh, to exit the building uh, as safely and as quickly as you, as you possibly can. Uh, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me very great pleasure to ask uh, Sir Nicholas Horton, Chief of the Defence Staff, uh, to speak to the Institute tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, John, for that very kind invitation. It's nice to see so many here. I'm delighted so many have turned out. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted my wife's here. It gives me the opportunity for her to listen to me for 20 minutes without any response. Um, I, can I say what an absolute pleasure it is? That's not in the record of the, the, the that's gone out. Um, I'll attempt no, Shall I take questions? No, I'll attempt not to extemporise too often. I'm very happy to continue what is now the established pre-Christmas tradition of giving a Chief of Defence Staff talk uh, to the Institute. Uh, but if the fact of this talk is now something of a tradition, I'm not just as certain whether or not the style of the talk is yet so established. Is this meant to be an armed forces state of the nation? Is it meant to be a stare into the defence and security crystal ball? Or is it, in my case, an assessment of the challenge six months in? Or is it merely some pre-Christmas entertainment. Well, my own view is that an opportunity such as this should not be wasted on some rosy reflections or some self-indulgent congratulations. It is to me an opportunity. It's an opportunity to inform, to enlighten, and to challenge. Uh, in doing so, it is not my intention to be critical, radical, or rogue. But it is my purpose to inform debate because I strongly believe that, given the emerging security challenges of the age, defence has more to do to be fully fit for purpose in all respects. Uh, if I were to offer a thesis for this talk, then it would be that the current paradigm, which informs the funding, structure and employment of defence and the armed forces, will need to evolve in order to meet the emerging defence and security challenges of the age. We are in a situation which thoughtful people should pay attention to, and that the Ministry of Defence and government more widely will need to respond to in the years ahead. Now, in many respects, this audience is not the target of this talk, but what I would like you to do here is pay witness to an outing of professional conscience, which I hope will then guide some of the activities of defence over the next few years. I'll structure what I have to say in four parts. The first will cover the international security context. The second will cover the UK domestic context. Uh, in the third, I will briefly outline what I see as the current UK paradigm for funding, force structure, and employment of military power. And then in the final section, I'll set out some of the things that I believe we need to do in response to the situation that I portray. I am humble enough to recognise that the situation I describe will not be a wholly accurate one and that the responses I suggest will not necessarily be sufficient 
of themselves. But my thesis is born of individual observation and experience, not of exhaustive research and analysis. So, let me make a start. What I have to say about the international security context will, I think, to many or most in this audience, not be revelatory. I capture it in four observations. They are uncertainty, instability, the advent of threats which are more diverse, less existential, and less symmetric than hitherto, and fourthly, the increasing mutuality of nations and the interdependence <coughs> of the world in general. The uncertainty is partly a product of both economic and demographic change in the current world order. Old Europe is in relative economic and demographic decline. The Asia-Pacific is in the ascendancy, and the United States is somewhere between pivot and rebalance. It is also in part a product of policy shifts and diplomatic in initiatives which, in many parts of the world, and specifically in the Middle East at the moment, will alter a status quo which some nations have become comfortable with. The instability is also uh, obviously evident in the Middle East, but also North Africa, where the so-called Arab Spring has not necessarily liberated the forces of democracy. But the potential for instability spreads much wider. It is the primary internal concern of both Russia and China and manifests itself in increasing areas of ungoverned space in the Sahel, the Horn of Africa, potentially still astride the Afghan-Pakistan border. And instability is a maritime as well as a land-based phenomenon, as witnessed in the Gulf of Guinea, the South and East China Seas, and the Indian Ocean. The third element, the advent of more diverse and less state-based threats, has become an increasing feature of this age. Most mature Western democracies no longer for the moment face existential state-on-state -state threats in classic force-on-force -force terms. Rather, the challenges are more insidious. There are threats which relate to terrorism, to international crime, to energy resources and critical national infrastructure. There are challenges to our human security, our ways of life. There are hazards which derive from the dangerous conditions attendant on a warming planet. And there are threats which have emerged in the rising domain of cyberspace. And my fourth and final condition of the international security scene is the phenomenon of mutuality. The world is increasingly interdependent. Nations depend on other nations, but the nature of the way power interacts between countries has become far more diffused. Now, what are the implications of all this? Well, I think it is possible to derive some quite clear conclusions. The first is that countries such as the United Kingdom, which derive their relative power and prosperity from the maintenance of a stable world and an international rules-based order, are confronted by the twin challenges of uncertain change and instability. So, in some respects, the grand strategic challenge of the age could be seen as how do we accommodate change whilst maintaining stability. A second conclusion is that the content of much of the current military inventories of Western nations, optimised as they are for symmetrical state-on-state -state conflict at scale, is in need of review. Review not necessarily change, but review. And my third conclusion is that the dangers to the homeland which derive from novel threats, widespread instability, and the diffusion of power beyond state monopoly begs a re-examination of homeland security and national domestic resilience. So moving on to part two. Can I next move to the UK domestic scene where the military instrument of national power is increasingly confronted by challenges in respect of funding, utility, and societal support. I'm not tonight going to say that defence immediately needs more public funding. In part, this is because I do buy into the narrative that there can be no strong defence without a strong economy. I also believe that defence needs to continue to improve its financial competence, 
both in reputation and in real terms, if it's going to win the argument for more funding. But what I will say tonight is that the leadership of the armed forces are bought into a wider narrative that speaks to the real terms growth in defence funding that should accompany the nation's recovery from austerity. This is a narrative which the Prime Minister himself has acknowledged. Defence will need real growth in the next Parliament if the reality of the force structure set out in the last SDSR is to be realised. But, and this is my second point, defence is also going to have to better prioritise its money towards the things which are most relevant to the security demands and capability needs of the future. This point links to the absence, for the moment at least, on state-based symmetrical threats at scale. My third point relates to the state of domestic support for the use of military force. And in truth, I could extend this point to that of political anxiety about its beneficial use and incremental legal constraint on its employment. My prevailing view is captured in the assessment that the United Kingdom's armed forces have never in the 40 years I've known them been held in such popular high regard. But the purposes to which they've most recently been put has seldom been more deeply questioned. As a nation, we have become a touch sceptical about the ability to use force in a beneficial way. Such a combination of tight national resources, concerns regarding utility, and political and societal reservation about the beneficial use of military force does not create a benign environment for defence funding. And my stark conclusion is that when you combine the international security context to the UK domestic scene, then one of my great challenges as CDS is to help to revalidate the utility of the military instrument of national power in the minds of government and the wider public. Part three. The third part of what I want to say is just to pause a moment on what I called the current paradigm of defence in respect of funding, force structure and force employment. We are in truth already making considerable progress to change this paradigm, but I will tell it as starkly as I can to make my more general point. Defence has for many years, certainly since the successful end of the Cold War and in strong international company within Europe, been managing the decline of military hard power. Defence funding has been reducing and we have enjoyed reduced manoeuvre room in how we spend defence's money. Increasingly, we have spent it on large capital equipment programmes, often with an eye on supporting the United Kingdom's defence industrial base. Our approach has been through an equipment lens which has emphasised technical overmatch in force-on-force -force conflicts. And whilst exquisite technology has been protected as the key to operational superiority, manpower has been seen more as an overhead, and activity levels and training have been squeezed. Indeed, the one bit of Defence's future funding that has political commitment to real growth is the equipment programme. But the dawning reality is that even if we maintain the non-equipment budget in real terms, rising manpower costs raise the prospect of further manpower and activity cuts in the future. Unattended, our current course leads to a strategically incoherent force structure. Exquisite equipment, but insufficient resources to man that equipment or train on it. This is what the Americans call the spectre of the hollow force. We're not there yet, but across defence I would identify the Royal Navy as being perilously close to its critical mass in manpower terms. Elsewhere in the paradigm, we remain too platform focused and insufficiently concerned about what I call enablers. The historic service centric major equipment focus has left us with relatively strong environmental components but, if you like, a body devoid of senses, senses and a central nervous system. I exaggerate, but you get the point. We are critically deficient in the capabilities which enable the joint force, such things as intelligence, surveillance, compatible communications, joint logistics and tactical transport. 
Next, I would observe, as we enter our final year of combat in Helmand and revert to a contingent posture, the paradigm continues to fund defence's capabilities primarily to hold forces at readiness, not to fund them for proactive activity in this uncertain and unstable world. And so much of a £33 billion national insurance policy could sit awaiting the next crisis because it is only funded for contingency and not for engagement. And if the government wants to use it, it has first to have a discussion about who is paying. And the final part of the paradigm has the potential to become the most damaging of all. It is the creeping aversion to risk in the employment of our armed forces. And this aversion has multiple origins, some in politics, some in society, some legal, some in the media, and some in the armed forces themselves. I have recently observed with some admiration the relative ability of French forces to operate with a mindset of aggressive risk management. We must be careful as a society and as a professional military not to lose our courageous instinct, since it is one of the things which keeps us for the moment in a class apart. So the final part. The final part of what I want to do is offer some thoughts on how we should respond to the circumstances I have described. And I'll cover three areas briefly, funding, structure, and the employment of our defense capability. As far as the funding is concerned, again, this is not the moment to ask for more. But we must, as we go forward, protect what we have and ensure that there is a balanced investment in our people as well as our equipment. I would argue most strongly that it is our people that gives the United Kingdom's armed forces our qualitative edge. So we must protect our ability to recruit and retain the best in both our regular and reserve forces. We must also be careful that the defence budget is not disproportionately used to support British defence industry. There is a strong strategic case to retain specific sovereign capabilities in national hands, and there are very sound reasons to husband the ability to reconstitute specific capabilities nationally. But the defence budget d does not exist primarily to subsidise the defence industry or promote defence exports. It exists to maximise defence capability, though it should do so in a way that recognises that our national defence industry does have a part to play as an element of our national hard power. And finally on funding, we must find better ways of resourcing activity that sits in the grey area of conflict prevention and upstream stabilisation, or we will fail to monetize a, new, a huge national asset which can considerably assist the delivery of such things as developmental benefits in other countries. As far as the force structure is concerned, we must exploit the advent of the Joint Forces Command to champion the enablement of the force. This command, the Joint Forces Command, is now the proponent for C4ISR, for cyber, for special forces, for joint logistics and defence medical services. It owns those things which represent the nervous system of capability, and its age has now come. A second consideration on structure, especially as the United States rebalances, is our use of alliances and coalitions. We must start to be braver in recognizing that the European pillar of NATO has to start to genuinely share capability rather than indulge in some reductionist alchemy which leaves everyone doing less of the same. And finally, on the employment of defense capability. If the United Kingdom wants to stay in the Premier League of smart power, then it must, of course, invest in armed forces that can generate hard power capability. That is, and a hard power capability that is credible in respect of conventional coercion and deterrence. But having done that, government must not, given the security challenges of the age, keep that capability at home, waiting for the next intervention. Rather, it must exploit it proactively in meeting the challenges of stabilizing an uncertain and dangerous world, helping to prevent conflict, and to build the security capacity 
of other nations. Uh, in this context, I would suggest that we need to be far more proactive in our investment in United Nations operations. After all, such operations come pre-funded and with the benefit of an extant legal mandate which confers legitimacy. And I also think that the time has come to dramatically professionalise the career stream of the international officer. The days of defence attaché appointments being a reward for a career well spent cannot continue. In adopting a strategic posture of engagement, we can better add to the country's influence on the world stage, support national security policy objectives, and be more proactive on the national prosperity agenda. We will also sustain the potential for attractive and fulfilling careers for those who do not want to live ordinary lives. But most importantly of all, we will understand far better the areas of potential conflict. Because, to misquote Antonio Gustozzi, arguably one of the follies of our current age has been an unmatched ambition to change the world without bothering to understand it first. Lastly, we must recognise that the domestic dimension of security threats, rather than merely being terrorist-related, could impact on national critical infrastructure such that a national domestic response is needed and at scale. We must re-evaluate from a defence perspective the nature of our approach to homeland security and to domestic resilience. And we should be mindful that the prospect of state-sponsored asymmetry could change many of our calculations about the security of the United Kingdom in the years to come. Well, that's all I intended to say. And uh, as I said at the outset, I may be wrong in some of this, but it makes sense to me. You can be reassured that some of this is already in hand. And if some of what I have said seems unduly alarming, it's because I do not think it's the job of a CDS to pamper to a comfortable state of negligence in matters of our nation's security. I remain convinced that the provision of such security cannot be wished away and will remain one of the defining duties of government. But the armed forces will need to evolve to ensure that they remain appropriate to the demands of the age in which we live. And the country must sustain the appetite to use them appropriately in the national interest. Well, thank you and have a very happy Christmas. And can I, on your behalf, extend that greeting to the many thousands of UK servicemen and women serving in Afghanistan and around the world this Christmas. I'm sure you would want to join me in thanking them and their families and friends at home for all they do on our behalf, especially at this time of year. Thank you very much.